Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Gene Kogan. I want to thank the organizers and Digilog for having me. I'm really thrilled to be back in Turkey. I was, last time I was here, I was in college, just backpacking, so it's very different circumstances now. Um, I'm an artist and a programmer, and I'm going to talk a lot about machine learning. So uh, I'll, let me just describe like my background a little bit. I, uh, for a long time, I worked in this field of music information retrieval which is concerned with making tools for uh, either mu uh, to, let's say, the science of extracting information from music. And uh, it's a very dry and scientific field, but there's a lot of musicians who are interested in it, of course, and musicians were always kind of bringing in very new and creative ideas about production and composition and making new kinds of musical instruments. And so this got me thinking a lot about more artistic side of machine learning. I started working a lot with creative coding toolkits, and I learned how to use processing and open frameworks. Um, I hadn't studied programming formally at that point, and so that kind of got me moving towards this path that I'm in today. And um, so, well, let's talk about AI. Uh, if you look at the news about AI almost any day of the week, uh, you're going to see headlines like this. So something like uh, Facebook's AI invents its own language, or uh, the thing on the right is from today. I just, that's the first thing I saw. I took a screenshot on the news today. Pepper, the AI robot, gives evidence to parliament, right? So it's all this very magical, kind of hyper-realistic, exaggerated, exaggerated stuff. Um, and the tech companies themselves don't really help anything because uh, this is the CEO of Google saying that AI is more important than electricity and fire. Yeah, so more important than fire. So that's, that's kind of what the state of, thing, state of things is today. <laughs> Um, but, but it's really not that magical. It's, it's actually quite real. And, um, and, and also, it's, it's all of us, right? It's all of our data. Like, that's, that's what machine learning is. It's, it's our data, right? And it's flawed, and it makes mistakes, and it's not good at everything. Uh, and it's, it's useful to understand a little bit about how these things actually work, right? And most machine learning systems are something like this. It's a function that learns how to map one kind of data into another kind of data. So to recognize an image of a dog as a dog, right? But uh, machine learning systems are much more general than that. They can actually do things like analyze text and tell you the sentiment of it, like what emotion is in that text. They can transcribe audio into speech. They can detect objects in photographs. They can uh, segment images into different components and label them, um, and they can make art. And this is kind of what's been obsessing me for the last few years. I've been trying to think of a, up of a good reason to explain why, why machine learning is so interesting to artists, and I think it goes something like this. Um, this, is, this is a work by Janelle Shane, who's working with this uh, a type of generative model which takes text that you input, you know, a sentence, and then it makes an image of what a computer thinks that sentence should look like. And it's, it's, it's really kind of getting at, the, it's getting at something like the collective imagination of things. That's the way I think of it, because um, the, where, where this comes from is a lot of training data, a lot of people looking at actual photographs and writing down what those photographs are of. And then we can take this as a publicly available data set called MS Coco, and we can use that. We can train an algorithm to go in the reverse direction. And so this, to me, is like a capturing the sort of imagination of people, right? And that's, that's what's so interesting to me about it. Um, I've really been obsessed with this idea for a long time. So one of my earliest artistic projects with machine learning was this project called Color of Words, where I used... Uh, a, I would do a Google image search on words, and then I would download several hundred images, and then I would do this analysis of the color distribution, because I wanted to find out what the colors of different words are, right? So, like, you can see that winter, spring, summer, and fall, right? They, it should kind of resonate, right? Fall is kind of brown, and, you know, winter is very, very bluish and white and different holidays have colors associated with them, Valentine's Day is pink and so on. So I've always been really interested in this sort of collective mind, uh, and, that, and that's kind of where um, that, well, that has led me to, to what I'm doing today. 
for the last few years, maybe seven or eight years, there's been some research into how to visualize neural networks. Neural networks are the dominant machine learning algorithms, and they are learning different kinds of features about images, let's say. And it can be useful for us to try to use techniques, research techniques, to visualize what the different parts of neural networks are learning. And most people became kind of familiar with this maybe about three years ago. The research is maybe seven or eight years old, but about three years ago there was something called Deep Dream. So maybe some of you saw that. I don't know if, if that was big, uh, made big waves here. Uh, but Deep Dream kind of was this process by which you can start with an image of pure noise and then make it sort of visualize the things that a neural network kind of thinks it sees. It's hard to describe in, in 10 minutes, so I can't really get into the details. But it made, was making images like this. And this is work by the original creator of Deep Dream, named Alex Mordvintsev. Uh, and you can see, like, uh, I'm sure the objects are sort of popping out into your eyes, right? Um, and this is some work by Mike Tyka, also originally involved in Deep Dream. Uh, and he introduced a lot of the initial sort of artistic flavors of, of Deep Dream. And I've been kind of following in this tradition a little bit the last few, the last year or two. Uh, I kind of started working with masking the different, so you can, let's say, visualize two different parts of the neural network, visualize two different features, and blend them together. And what you see is that where they're blending, the neural network kind of creates elements, uh, creates visualizations of, that have features of both a little bit. So, for example, like you have these two neurons on the side that are visualizing these features, and then in the middle there's, there's this kind of, you know, somewhere halfway between these two classes. Um, more of this kind of work, I'll just show you some, some examples of this, and some things work better than others. You can make video with this technique, so here, and it's using this sort of feedback process where I keep on running the the deep dream process on top of the output, distorting it somehow, and then feeding it back into the algorithm. And so you can kind of go on and on in this way. Um, a little while ago, I figured out how to make perfect loops. So I was kind of struggling a little bit with trying to figure out how to make very high resolution movies on things like Twitter and Instagram. And you know, they have these 15 megabyte limits. And then I figured, oh, maybe I can make a movie seem a lot longer than it actually is. These are actually just three seconds long, both of them. So they're going in perfect loops. And no one can notice. That's the secret. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been really interested in this texture synthesis. It's like the imagination of a neural network. And here again, these are loops. This is Google Maps. The Google Maps of your nightmare, maybe. Like if you're falling into a map. This is Hokusai, so the Great Wave off Kanagawa, a very famous uh, painting, 19th century Japanese painting. Kandinsky, um, you know, one of the first abstract artworks, and I'm just making infinite amounts of Kandinsky. Actually, it's not infinite, it's just three seconds long, but it seems infinite anyway. Um, and uh, these collages, so I started collecting paintings by different painters and then creating these kind of style collages. And so if you know anything about the work of Frida Kahlo, she made a lot of self-portraits, and so you kind of see like random loose eyebrows and eyes, and noses, and just kind of, here's an eyebrow, I think. <laughs> um, Jackson Pollock, of course, you know, needs no, this is pretty self-explanatory. Georgia O'Keeffe, she was very well known for, for making paintings of flowers. So these are just flowers. Salvador Dali, uh, of course, you know the hanging clocks, those weird abstract clocks. I think you see a few of them over here. Um, so the next thing I want to introduce is generative models. And these are representational models of image data sets. Uh, so basically, you take a big data set of images, let's say of faces, you feed it to the neural network, and it learns how to make new faces. Right? And uh, this is very interesting to scientists, because they're interested in understanding how things work. And to make a generative model of something, something that generates the data, is, is in a way kind of knowing how it works, let's say, maybe. Um, Richard Feynman would say that, I really like this quote, uh, what I cannot create I do not understand. And this is a quote that kind of maybe captures a little bit of the interest, scientific interest in, in generative models. And of course it has a, a nice artistic interest too because it gets into this, this collective mind that I was referring to earlier. One of the first papers to get into this, this DCGAN, Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Networks. Very interesting algorithm, no time to get into the details, but I highly encourage you to look that up. 
they, they talk about how you can combine the different features of these neural networks and do arithmetic on them. So generate a man with glasses, subtract man, add woman, and you get woman with glasses. And I was really, really fascinated by this. I used it in a, a work in 2015, I think one of the first general adversarial network art projects, where I downloaded a whole data set of handwritten Chinese characters. And then this is generating these handwritten Chinese characters. And at that time, this was just three years ago, we could only do about 32 pixels. Really, really simple images, and things have actually gotten steadily more and, uh, more, and more advanced, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, again, you can do these interpolations between the different features, between different characters. And I like to think of this as kind of like each of the intermediate points between ex really existing Chinese characters are almost like Chinese characters that never did exist, but could, you know, maybe like they're conceptually halfway in between the actual, you know, between people and culture. There's some sort of a concept that you could assign a character to, but for some reason, no one, no one ever actually put it down on paper. Um, so GANs, uh, progressively growing GANs, this is just from last year, and they uh, have made a lot of progress over the last three years or so. This, these are 1,024 pixels, or actually 512 pixels, sorry making things like cats and screens and cars and bicycles and bedrooms. And it's really amazing to, to see the, the progress, the speed of the progress that we've seen over the last couple of years. And I've been uh, using this also in my own work. I trained one of these progressively growing GANs on a data set of paintings, like around 100,000 paintings on an open source data set called WikiArts. So if you go to WikiArts, you'll see it has an archive of many paintings by many, many different people all over the world. And so if you feed one of these generative models with them, it learns how to make paintings. And so you can kind of see this is like the, what we might call the latent space, space of, of, of uh, sort of digital paintings. And so you see things like landscapes and portraits. This is one single uh, neural network that is making all of these images which is really crazy how much capacity it has, right? And that makes abstract artworks, things that look like it came from books. This actually looks a little bit like Rafik's archive dreaming, right? You see like kind of the text, uh, maybe documents that it's dreaming up. Makes things that look like portraits and abstract works and, uh, you know, lots of different stuff. So I'm running out of time, so I think I have to skip uh, image translation, but you can also do image filtering. So this is like creating hallucinating, as we say, cities, like whole cityscapes. Image, uh, like this is Milan in the style of Los Angeles and Venice. You do a sort of style transfer on the quality of the city. And um, you can also do this for face transfer. So this is uh, from about two years ago. I made this two years ago, almost two years ago, where I could basically train a, uh, a sort of, you know, presidential mask, and, if, and then I could put myself in front of the camera, extract my face, and then generate the face of this president, right? And this is, you think this is funny, right? But the thing is that th this was a, you know, a hacky version of this two years ago, but now, this is research from NVIDIA just, just uh, a few months ago. Look how realistic these are. These are all synthetic faces. Right? So all you need is a few minutes of recordings of somebody's faces, and you can learn to synthesize it. So in one year, you know, people ask me, what do I do? This is what I say now. I warn people about the future. <laughs> because in one year, let's say, you'll be, anyone will be able to imitate anybody else at any time. Right? So you can imitate the President of the United States. I mean, maybe, maybe some other heads of state might not really appreciate that so much, right? So, and you can imagine, I don't know, who, who could I be talking about? Well, um, this is the kind of thing that we have to be thinking about, and artists, I think, are responsible for sort of probing. Um, and, and if you're not convinced yet, this is from three weeks ago, Big Gans, like hyper-realistic. These are not real images. These are do these dogs, cheeseburgers, mushrooms, islands, completely synthetic images, right? So amazing stuff. Okay, so I have one minute left. I just want to make a little plug. I've been really interested in um, teaching for a long time. I've been teaching this course called Machine Learning for Artists, and like uh, my cohorts uh, who were talking about open source and arts toolkits earlier, um, I make a habit of sharing everything that I do. I put all of my lectures online, 
Um, and um, because I'm interested in promoting this kind of education. And so I put all of this online into a website called ml4a.github.io. That stands for Machine Learning for Artists. And it's a large collection of resources and guides and instructional guides uh, for people to, who are interested in getting into this field. Everything is free and online. I teach lots and lots of workshops. We're having one here. I've, I've had maybe something like 60 over the last two years, so it's been almost like a full-time job for me. And these are just some screenshots of them. And I'm currently teaching a class at NYU, New York University, and I'm putting all of the lectures online. So if anyone who's interested in hearing much more of this in much more detail, uh, please, I encourage you to go to this, to this website and check it out. Um, so that's all. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.